Let's go to Romans chapter 2, and I would like to read verses 1 through 16. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now last week we went through these verses and I wanted to continue to go through the very same verses with a different emphasis on the doctrines that are being taught here. And last week we talked about how this was addressing the Jew and also the Gentile. The idea of God in the, in the Word of God and also God in the creation of man was to reveal himself in a certain way. And we know that Paul is making this point clear in that man is without excuse and that the law that has been revealed to the Jew is very similar but not as specific as the revelation of who God is in the creation. And so both are inexcusable. But Paul is addressing in the very first verse of chapter 2 that you that judge... Now, this has to do with both Jew and Gentile, but it does pertain mostly to the Jew because he was the one that was able to take the law of God and be a teacher to the Gentile and say, don't you know that God is to be worshipped? He is to be recognized as God, and you should not do these immoral things. And they became the teacher of the Gentiles. But Paul is saying, you have received the law, but many... Many have not done the law. And so just hearing the law and being a holder or a steward of the law does not justify you in the sight of God, nor does it give you an excuse. And like I said many times, my former instructor in the army, my drill sergeant, he would always <laughs> tell us this, I don't want to hear why you were unable to accomplish your mission. You give me reasons, but none of them are excuses. And this verse tells us that Paul is saying go to, both to the Gentile and to the Jew, which, by the way, is all. When we read in these scriptures that God is saying to all men, it is saying to the Jew and to the Gentile that you are without excuse. And that is the very message of chapter 2. There is no excuse. Now, I would like to reread the entire chapter in about three or four verses. Because there are some things here that basically Paul says, this is a fact, 
Let me explain it. This is a fact. Let me explain it. And then he has a parenthesis that says, by the way, this is what I'm talking about. And then it goes back to the very same statement. So I'm going to read the whole chapter over again, but I'm only going to read about four verses. Verse number one. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. I'm going to stop right there. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now go to verse number 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law, and as many as sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And now the last verse. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so I would like to teach the entire chapter in this one statement. Everyone is guilty. That's it. Everyone is guilty. Now, you're guilty, and he goes on to give a, a deeper explanation. Because the Gentiles, they want to throw up an excuse. We didn't know. They throw up the excuse of ignorance, and Paul says, there is no excuse. The creation cries out. There is within you the witness of God that says, you are without excuse. Now, the Jew may say, ah, but we know, and we have the law. God is our friend. We have Abraham to our father. We have circumcision. We have these proofs that God is on our side, and we are his people. And he is saying, no. All are guilty. Especially, your guilt is aggravated if you know the law and accuse the Gentile of being guilty of, in, of, being, uh, of God's law, and yet you have done the very same thing. Now, we may say, well, what about those Jews that didn't do it? No. There are no Jews that did keep the law. Paul will go on with that argument. We'll, cut, we'll, we'll get in depth later on. But there is none that seek after God. There is none that doeth good. We will get there. But right now, he's just making the statement, everyone will perish. Everyone will die because they deserve that. That's what this chapter is about. Now, we're going to go back and take a little bit closer look at his explanations and so on. We went over that last week concerning the Gentile and some of the Jew, and so I won't cover that again. However, I will make a, a closer examination of some of these scriptures concerning what the judgment is about. And I want to remind you that now Paul is going to say to the Gentile and also to the Jew that God is going to judge in truth. This is verse number two. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, to, very, to, to make that statement implies that there are those who would make a judgment, but not in truth. How many of you make a judgment to buy something based solely upon a commercial? You see it on TV or you hear it on a radio and they say, Someone made the best radio. It's about time. I'm going to go buy it right now. You know? Or someone said they look at a, 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 you know, a commercial for a car. And all you see are smiling faces and happy people, children obeying in the back seats, and they're driving with the air on, and everything is just perfect. The weather is perfect. The road is perfect. The car is perfect. That's what the commercial says. And we all know that this is judgment according to truth, right? <laughs> In other words, we asked, tell us about your car. It's all good. Everything about it is good. Now, we do that with ourselves to everyone else. Here, I want you to meet my friend. Hey, introduce yourself. Well, I'm this, I'm that. And they never try to, I don't know what the opposite of impress you is, <laughs> depress you. <laughs> I want to be able to tell you all the good things about me. Look at me. I, I'm happy. I'm smiling. I have my best clothes on. And we have that tendency to be a commercial for ourselves. Now, I am in the process of looking for a job. We all know that my contract is over with, with the Air Force, and that we're looking and I'm writing a resume. So what do you think a resume is? It's the commercial of Russ. <laughs> Thank you for turning in. I would like to tell you about Russ. And in my resume, I do not write down all my failures. 
<laughs> I write down the things that I can do for them. I have done this, I can do that for you. I have done this, I can do that for you. Look at me, eight by 10 glossy, I buy me. <laughs> buy a Russ right today, okay? That's what a resume is. And when I do my yearly evaluation, my manager asks me to do it. He, he tells all his people, write your own evaluation and then I'll compare it with what I think. <laughs> and so that he doesn't have to think about the good things, he only has to track the bad things. And so he makes a comparison, then he makes an evaluation. And so we are accustomed to making this type of judgment. And we seem to think that we, since no one can see the secrets of our hearts, that our advertisements of who we are and our commercials of who we are are true because you cannot prove it's wrong. Right? Who are you to judge me? You can't see on the inside of me. This is my resume. This is who I am. But God is saying that his judgment is different than the judgment of men. Why? What makes it different? It's true. That's the difference. God is true when he judges us. Now, Paul goes on to do this type of examination of the type of judgment of God. And let's continue with that. Um, this is found in verse number 6. God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And that's the summation of it, isn't it? Now, if we think that God knows all things and that he is all-powerful, this statement should put fear into every heart. Every one of us should fear that the secrets of men shall be revealed and judged because that is the last sentence or the last verse of this chapter. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God will judge all men. Now Paul is trying to drive home the point that there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, that all are going to be guilty, that all will perish because both have lifted up to God and for all men to see their excuses. Of course, there is no excuse. Paul says, you're inexcusable. There is no excuse for you. So, he has already said to the Gentile, you have the creation that witnesses against you. And to the Jew, you have not only the creation, but you have the revealed will of God. All these things. Now, you will both perish. Now, we may say, well, you know, there's got to be some mitigating circumstance. You know what that means, mitigating <coughs> circumstance? That means there's got to be some reasons that will make me less guilty than others. God knows them all. There is no reason or mitigating circumstance that will justify not condemning you. There is none. God knows the truth about you. He is not going to listen to your commercial about yourself. He's not going to read your resume about yourself. He's not going to see and Google you on what you have put on your Facebook about you. He's not going to do any of that. He has a way of knowing the secrets. What does it say in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 when it comes to the judgment of God? Okay, you may be looking it up right now, but I'll tell you what it says. The book's were opened. The books were opened. Now when it comes to the books, there is always this fear if you're the one being audited. How many have ever heard of, of a company that says, oh, they have two sets of books? Anybody hear that phrase? You know what that means, right? A book for the auditor and a book for what's really going on. <laughs> Okay, the auditor gets all the good figures that makes it look good, but what's really going on is a lot of shenanigans. And so that is the way we are. Now, this has been addressed already. We covered it last week, but I would like to bring it up again. Uh, if you would, please, uh, let's go back where it says in verse number five, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now within that verse, there is couched a little phrase 
that tells you the secret of how God is going to find out. Of course, he knows all things, but it has to do with you treasuring up the wrath of God. Now, what does that mean? You, usually, a person's anger is not something you treasure. But what is a treasure? Now, how many of you, you don't have to tell me out loud, but how many of you have a little box at home that you keep your little treasures in? I have a small box, and inside of it, I have a few tiny little worthless treasures to the world, but they are very valuable to me. They belong to my mother. One is a little book that tells me all the hours that she flew an airplane. She was a pilot <laughs> for a little while. She was too afraid to drive a car, but she did fly a plane. I don't know. But I treasure it. And there's a little watch that doesn't work. I treasure it. I put it in a box. It's no one else's business. No one ever wants it. And if it should ever be auctioned off, they would say, uh, put it in the free box. <laughs> but not for me. It's a treasure to me. Now, there are some things that you might be surprised is a treasure to you because you have put it into a little place that you have hidden from the rest of the world because it's not listed on your resume. It's not listed in the commercial of Russ. It's not listed on your Facebook because you have decided to do things that you know God is not happy with and that you know God condemns, but you have secretly treasured this sin. But keeping it in your secret place, in your heart and in your life, God has a book and he keeps track. And I have a suspicion, and I'm not going to say that this is true, but I have a suspicion that when God opens the books, he's going to take your treasure box and open it up. And he's going to say, thank you for keeping track for me. Because now I'm going to make your secrets open to judgment and all will see because God has said, my son Jesus Christ will judge the secrets of men. And these secrets were their treasures. What they kept in their hearts and treasured up until the day of wrath. Because they wanted the things of darkness and they suppressed the knowledge of God. And they would rather have the pleasures of sin for a season than to give them up. And that's what happens to men who do not love God, but love rather the praise of men or the honor of men or the glory that comes from men rather than the smile of God or the honor and glory that only comes from God. And now you say, well, are you sure that's true? Well, let's read on and find out. In verse number six, let's read it again. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now, the two groups are these. Those who obey the truth and those who do not obey the truth. The first one, verse 7 to this, uh, is to the first one. To them who, by patient continuance in well-doing, seek glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. That's what they're looking for. But, the other group, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish. Those two groups, and these are how you distinguish them. Now, do you see the first group where we have by patient continuance in well-doing? What do they seek for? Glory. Now, some may say, well, that, sound, that doesn't sound like it's a good thing to seek for glory. It sounds like a show-off or something like that. No, 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 no. We're talking about the real glory, the real McCoy, not the fleshly glory, not standing in pride to be praised by man, but to be praised by God, to seek the glory of God and to be like the one you worship. A lot of people like to have hero worship in their lives and like to say, oh, look at that football player. He's not a very good example because we know when we were young, we had hero worship. And as soon as somebody did something wrong who was a very well-known ball player, they would, oh, that's awful. Nowadays, it's trash talk town. Everybody does it. Nobody cares. It's so sad that we have no real heroes in, in this type of uh, deal. But our hero worship is like this. Jesus Christ should be our hero. And we should love and honor and praise and have such admiration that our hearts long to be like him. We should have that type of hero worship. And that's the kind of glory we seek and honor. We want our Lord to be honored. We don't want our lives to be a dishonor to him. And we want the honor of being a friend of God. 
We want the honor and the glory of receiving his smile. All these things, why? Because we want to have our flesh and our souls live in his presence. Not just live and not die, but we want to live with God forever because he is our friend. We want to be in heaven with God. Without God, heaven is just another place. It's just an empty place. It would be hell. And therefore, we seek eternal life. And what is life? To know Jesus Christ. Now, you know what contentious means, right? Argumentative. I can be a very contentious fellow. When I get into a bad, ugly mood, it doesn't matter what you say to me, I will argue with you about it. <laughs> it's not a good trait. It's not a good thing. And I have, uh, I have a wise wife that sometimes when she notices I'm always arguing with her, she kind of backs away until I get better, until I get over it. But being contentious with God shows a type of arrogance and pride that these people, and compare that to the first group, patient continuance. We have an impatience with God, and we still continue to argue with God over our own resume because he is our judge. Who is God to judge us? Do you really know me in the heart? I'll tell you what I'm about. You know, it's kind of like this. I'm going to give you the commercial and just believe the commercial, okay? about myself. That's what people argue with God about. That they are not that bad that they should perish under just judgment. How, are, how is God's judgment different than our judgment? He judges according to truth as compared to the way we judge. According to the commercial we want people to buy. The commercial, the outward appearance that we want people to have of ourselves. That's the big difference. An argumentative nature of man. We have a natural bias to believe lies about ourselves and lies about the ones we love. It is a unique capability. And those, I, those words are so strange to use when it comes to sin. Sin gives us this unique capability of believing with comfort things we know are not true. I'm quite happy with my resume and with my commercial, and so should you. Who are you to doubt me? This is the way we have lived our lives, by living in denial of our sin. And those who do this continuously, arguing with God about their sin, that is the one group you don't want to be in. Now, how is God going to judge? According to their deeds. There are going to be a, there's going to be a group of people. Now, he's not talking Gentile and Jews. They're a type of that. Gentiles and Jews represent a type of God's people and a type that are not God's people, but they're basically really all the same. They all shall perish. But there is a group that are not contentious, that have lived their lives Patiently, patiently in continuance of well-doing. I said that kind of distinctly, didn't I? Because well-doing has to do with being judged by God in all that we do. Our actions shall be judged. God is going to judge, the, judge everyone in truth, all of your actions. And now you're saying... I didn't know the gospel was like that. I thought that I would be safe in the Lord Jesus Christ and my actions would not be judged. I am not saying that God is going to look at your actions and then based upon your actions say, I accept this man. No. God is not basing your friendship and acceptance upon your actions, but you will be judged and all your actions shall be judged according to truth. God will not dispense with his judgment because there is the judgment of the atonement. Remember that the great theme of this chapter are two things that are being revealed from heaven. One is the righteousness of God that satisfies God. 
and we accept that righteousness by faith. That righteousness was accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross where he atoned for our sins and imputed his righteousness to us. Our sins were imputed to him. That is not the issue that's being discussed. It is not whether we shall be accepted of God, but it does say, and we cannot forget the fact, that we shall be judged by God. The books shall be opened and all shall be judged. Now, there is going to be a general demeanor of all men who live by faith. And I like, to, I like it the way Habakkuk said it. The just by faith shall live. The just by faith shall live. Their lives are living the truth and honor and glory and law of God. And they patiently with their lives give themselves to living, doing well, doing well. And God is pleased with your doing well. Happy with it. Why? That's what friends do. Friends are happy with friends. Friends watch out for friends. God watches out for you. God loves you. And you will find, and you should know already, but it will be verified one day that all your good works are His works. You are His workmanship. But you know what? If you do not have those works, there's only one other group. There's only one other group, the contentious group, the contentious group that wants to argue with God about their actions and about the things they're going to be judged over. Let's go and take a look at that group again. But unto them who are contentious and do not. Okay, that's the key right there. One does, the other does not. Obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Now, what do they get? They do not get glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. What do they get? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish. Now, Paul has not lost his rabbit. He is not uh, confused or gone on a wayside here. or on a. Uh, he's really going into depth of his explanation of the Gentile has offered up the excuse of ignorance, and the Jew has offered up the, the excuse, or shall we say the reason, that they are God's people, and that the law was given to them, and that proves that they are not going to be judged in this way, or they are going to be found God's friend and not perish. But it says here, no, 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 no. You're judging not according to truth, God judges according to truth, and every man's actions. Now, that is the main point Paul is saying. I want to now go to verses 13 through 15, and I want you to closely look. If you have a King James Bible, you're going to notice that these uh, three verses have a parenthesis around the words, for not the hearers, See the parenthesis? And then it ends at the end of verse number 14, excusing one another. You know what that means? He is providing you with a small explanation of what's going on between verses 12 and 16. So let me read verses 12 and 16 together, and then we'll take a look at that parenthesis. In verse 12, we read this, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The main point is this. Everyone is going to perish if you didn't have the re peculiar revealed will of God called the scriptures. You're going to be judged by the natural law that is there by creation, uh, what God has put in you. Because here's the explanation. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now that particular verse right there, some people get really confused when they read it because it does not sound. The very words themselves make it appear as though, but the doers of the law shall be justified as though you must keep the law to be justified before God. But that's not, we're, we're not talking about how, what is acceptance of God. 
We're not talking about a sinner who has been justified by an imputed righteousness. We're talking about whether their claim that they are not guilty and should not perish is a justifiable argument. Do you see that? Now, you know what a justifiable argument is, right? An argument that makes sense and that is true. Okay? So, I read John Calvin on this, and I laughed, you know, I laughed when I read it. And I told my wife, and she laughed when she read it. It's, kind of, it's a little bit funny. It works like this. John Calvin said, Anyone that tries to prove that a man is justified by the law, by Romans 2.13, deserves to be mocked by children. That's where you laugh. <laughs> because it is so simple to know that this is not a doctrine that you must work to be justified. It isn't. It has to do with whether you are continuing in well-doing and seeking the glory that only comes from God and the honor that comes from God and your works prove it. Your works justify it. Or are you in the other group that lives accusing God all the time, always making excuses, always handing out your resume, always putting out your public commercial of who you are and saying, my private life is private, you're not allowed to look, you're only allowed to see what I give you. And, uh, and my, my, my attorney says, I'm allowed to do that. I'm not, you know, I take the fifth and I don't have to uh, incriminate myself. That's my constitutional right. Is that what you're going to do on the great white throne judgment? Throw up the United States Constitution to the Almighty and say, I am not, I, I, I'm not allowed to incriminate myself? No, no, no. You're coming with your treasure box. And you're going to open it up like the books. And the secrets are out. And what makes it different? What, what makes your defense difference, different than God's judgment? His is true. Yours is a commercial. Yours is a resume to be hired for a place in heaven. There's a job in heaven, and here's my resume. Look, your resume is worthless. It is what's in the box that counts. If your treasure is God, because you have continuously sought his face, and sought his smile, and sought acceptance by the blood, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Your works justify that testimony. Why? Because if you just hear the word, that's nothing. You have to do, and you have to obey. Your life of faith is what's working. It's, that is the works. Those are the secrets that shall be revealed. And so, in parentheses, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the, but the law shall be, uh, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the written law or the revealed law of God, do by nature the things that are contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Okay, he's taking away the prop or the excuse that they are ignorant, which show the work of the law, not the law. You know, we have, as Jeremiah says, the law of God written in our hearts where our hearts are changed and that writing of God's law upon our hearts is this is what our heart loves and this is what we want and this is what we desire and we work against the flesh. This is not the same thing. This is the work of the law, not the love of the law. The work of the law is to convict you of your sin. And even the creation itself does the work of the law because everyone knows stealing is wrong. We know that. God has showed that to us. He, we have that information within us, and it convicts us. And so, it shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. They even have their own court system, saying this man, man has been accused, I find him guilty. I, this man has been accused, he's innocent. He's, he's been accused and maybe excused or maybe found guilty. They have their own laws, their own ways of knowing. You know, you can't cheat on your wife, that's wrong. You can't steal from a neighbor, that's wrong. You can't 
perjure yourself, that's wrong. They have that law because God has shown it to them. But if you don't have the revealed word of God, you shall be judged by what you know. You shall be judged by the light that has been given to you. And God shall do it in justice. He shall do it in truth. Not like us. Not like people. And how, when, it will, when will it be done? And how shall it be done? In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so Paul is coming to a conclusion of an argument that I'm telling you, all men are guilty. When one group says, no, I have a mitigating circumstance, I, I didn't know. Another group says, now wait a minute, God's our friend. He gave us the law. We're his special people. He wouldn't do that to us. Doesn't matter. Paul is saying, both of you are in a bad spot. You're in a bad spot. You're both guilty. Some of us may think, seem to think that, well, most of us here are Gentiles. And so all we have to do is worry about what is in the creation. No, I'll tell you what. If you've got a Bible right here, you have what the Jews had. You are being held to that higher standard. To know much is to be responsible for much. I've always thought, a little bit like Luther, before he learned the truth that the just shall live by faith, I say, the more I learn, the more I'm responsible. I wish I could unlearn some of these things. I feel like I'm going to be so judged because it seems like I learn more than I do. And I'd rather do more than I learn. <laughs> that would be the safest for me. But there is a law of sin within me that seems to say, no matter how good it looks, no matter how pure it is, there's always something within me that does not want to obey God. Why? Because until God changes my body, I've got sin you know, living in me. But as long as I nurture and care for those things that, that seek the glory that only comes from God, and I starve those things that tempt me away from that. The sin that only satisfies for a season, and when I say a season, I'll put it this way, only in this life. Some people say, well, it only lasts you know, for a few minutes. A few minutes, nothing. If it lasts all your life, it's nothing but a few minutes. Really. If you can live in sin and not be caught in your entire life, it's just not long enough. You would, I would rather, I would hope that you would rather, like Moses, give up the pleasures of sin for a season that you might enjoy the pleasures of God forever. The pleasures that are God himself. Now, the conclusion is this. Paul said everyone is going to perish. Everyone. Why? Because God does not judge the way we judge. He judges according to truth. There is no excuse for whether you're ignorant or whether you have the law and you don't keep it. How do we know this is truth? Look in the treasure box and verify that if the truth were known, what would be the sentence? You better find out now. You should look honestly now. You should judge yourselves before God judges you. And then Paul is saying, this is how you will stand. If those who by patient continuance and well-doing seek, what does the scripture say about seeking? You will find if you seek. But what do you have to seek? Christ, God, the glory that comes from him only, the honor that comes from him only, the immortality that only is sweet if you're in the presence of God. Some people would kill the entire planet if they knew they could live forever. That's not the kind of immortality we're talking about. We're not talking about that sinful thing that, that people would say, oh, if I, could just live, if I could just live another 50 years, I'd kill everybody in Titusville. There are some people that would do that. This is not the kind of immortality we're talking about. It's talking like this. There is God and there is not God. Now, you're going to be in one of those places forever. You don't have to fight to live forever. Everyone is granted to be 
somewhere forever. Isn't that good news? Well, it's only good news for one group. It's only good news for those who, with patient continuance and well-doing, because if you're not in that group, to be given a body suitable to be punished forever is not what you want. You will be praying that the mountains could fall on you and end it. You would be praying that you could be covered up and annihilated and never exist. You would pray that you would never born. No, you are going to live forever. You're going to live in sin, being dead to God. Or you're going to live with God, being dead to sin. You're going to be immortal. Congratulations to the ones who live in well-doing. Well-doing. We are going to be judged. We're going to be judged. And I want you to know that it's going to be in truth. Therefore, is not the atonement of our Christ precious? And do not take that as, hmm, how can I put it? Do not take it as, I get to keep my evil treasures and not be judged for it. I get to throw my treasures away just before I reach heaven. No. All of your works shall be judged. If you are His, the house of God will be judged first. God judges His people now. What does the scripture say about taking the Lord's table unworthily? Some sleep. You know what that means. It doesn't mean you get a nap. It means that God will come and judge and God has killed some. What do you think happened to Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, you say, well, you're threatening me now. So, I'm telling you the truth. I am telling you the truth. Beware of provoking a holy God. Beware of a saint who will dare to be contentious with the Almighty. Do not think that you have a secret box that he does not know about. You treasure up those things. Watch your treasures. Watch. Look and see what is precious to you. A challenge to you, is it not? Is it not? Check your treasures out tonight. You need to open the box and clean house. Clean out the treasure box and say, you know, I never should have treasured that. Never should have treasured this. I should stop treasuring this. And what should you treasure? The beauties of Christ, the beauties of God, all those things that we can live our lives in a very patient, continuous way of well-doing. I know it sounds like it's just not that simple. Life just, it's got to be more than just doing good things. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It can be that simple. Doing the right thing is a treasure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Holy Father.